Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Aaron Johnson, Executive Director of the American Institute of Professional Geologists. I'd like you wel to welcome you to today's AIPG Lunch and Earn webinar. I apologize for the late start. A couple of quick housekeeping notes. First, if you need a CEU certificate for this presentation, please drop your name into the chat. And AIPG staff will make sure that you get a certificate that uh, acknowledges your participation in today's webinar. A second thing, we will have a webinar by Doug Bartlett looking at how we manage uh, mine water. That's going to come up on the 28th of March. So please kind of put that in your calendar. Today, it is AIPG past president Matt Rhodes. He's going to talk to us about drill rig and drilling photos today. He's going to give us an idea of how you plan a drill campaign. Matt has 40 years of experience in both exploration and environmental work and at one point was the state geologist of New Mexico. Uh, Matt, I'm going to turn this over to you. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Hello, everybody, and thank you all for signing on. Um, the late start is is that that was my fault. None of the organization here. Uh, it was my lack of organization, so I apologize for that. Um, I I divided this presentation into two phases, in part because I'm a visual learner. I'd like to describe the equipment and what you see and what things look like in the field rather than having discussion photo, discussion photo, discussion photo. And so I'm gonna save a lot of the discussion towards the tail end, but I'll editorialize on the photos as we go through them. And because I have a lot of information, uh, this is gonna be kind of like drinking from a fire hose. There's a lot of information. Nobody plans a drill campaign in, in six easy steps. And there, there are a lot of moving parts and a lot of inter, interrelated moving parts. So it's kind of a ganglionic planning process. But with that said, I'll show you a whole slew of photos of different drill rigs I've worked on and worked around uh, South America, Mexico, all over the West. And uh, I'll see what I can do to get this moving. Anyway, come on. Get this. Use your mouse, Matt. Kathy is not responding. He's not there. Let me wrap up the screen. Kathy, do you have to advance that or I got control? I'm just not seeing the controls at the bottom left. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to advance it now. Okay. Hold on just a moment. Okay, my screen went away. There we go. Oh, here we go. You know, we're having some technical difficulties with that. You want to go yeah, to the, the other one? The other presentation? Mm -hmm. Okay, we can do them in, in reverse. Actually, we can do these in reverse order, sure. Let's see. Apologize, everybody. We're having some issues. Okay. Well, if you want to go ahead and start talking, we'll work on getting your screen to go. Oh, okay. Well, I've did, I divided this whole process into about, I don't know, 14, 15 steps. Some are pretty pretty intuitive, intuitive and some of them are pretty counterintuitive. Some of them have real long lead items. And um, uh, contracting for a driller, finding one, competing um, uh, with, a, uh, with a, a scope of work. Um, there are a lot of involved processes, but I'll walk these through for you. I'm not going to read slides to you, so I won't insult your intelligence because you can read them faster than I can I can walk through them. But um, that's what we're going to cover here. Um, there's many things to do on the front end, and the onus is on you. Uh, as the professional geologist, you need to know that site as well as you possibly can. You need to know everything that is knowable um, before you start spending your clients' money. Because if you go in unprepared or you go in ill-advised and things that are counterintuitive in geologic sense, um, that's malfeasance. And, and so 
Um, some of these projects have a real stiff burn rate and that is you're spending a lot of money daily. So um, you need to be as prepared as you possibly can. Okay, Kathy. So one of the first things it comes down to is how are you gonna get onto the property? Uh, where's the location? And in this context, I'm talking about drilling way out west in the hinterlands, as well as way in the city for a, uh, in an urban, urban environment. So you need to work out the um, uh, first one applies to big uh, chemical facilities, big uh, refineries, big whatever manufacturing plants where the owner will dictate uh, how you come and go, what the speed limits are on the facility, what your operating times are, and uh, all the precautions you need to make. They probably have an on-site uh, safety orientation program. And that, that type of stuff is actually fairly straightforward. Uh, the next one is if you're working out west, um, really, once you get west of Salina, Kansas, you run into a lot of federal property and you, 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 there will be limitations imposed on your operation by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, the U.S. Forest Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the BLM and or the National Park Service. All of them have ongoing drilling campaigns that are working on their property, and they will tell you. Uh, what permits are required, what plans are required, everything you need to do up front. But if you're working in, in a public right-of-way um, in a municipality, they might require a, a traffic control plan and give you the hours of operation that you can work in a public right-of-way. You might have to sit, submit a traffic control plan to the city engineer and have it, have it approved. And if you're gonna work on city, uh, city right away, city property, they might ask you to put up a performance bond or a surety bond so that if you knock over their fire hydrant or you put, uh, you rut up uh, uh, the roadways or, or paved areas, you're gonna have to fix all those before they'll release you from the bond. Um, and then there's rumble access. If you're, if you're leaving a site, you're not allowed to track mud out onto the, out in the public right away. So you have to have big, big rumble strips or some people put down a real coarse gravel so it shakes as much mud off your vehicles coming and going uh, so that you don't incur any fines. And uh, the, the fines can be pretty stiff and they'll tell you on the front end um, what you're gonna have to pony up in case you get crosswise with uh, uh, the city engineer or somebody coming out to inspect the, the project. So as a geologist, you, there's a bunch of things you need to know before you go. And that is know everything that's conceivably possible about that location. Um, and each individual drilling location within the program, you have to have a, in the oil patch, they call it a well prog, but you have to have a well prognosis such that you understand the, uh, to, the to the extent that it's possible, you understand the uh, site geology, the stratigraphy, where the water table is, everything that's knowable about that site. Then specifically, everything that's knowable about that drilling location. Are you just going into twin some old locations that uh, you've got some old logs on? Or are you uh, stepping out from old locations uh, to gain more information and maybe extend the, the aerial extent of groundwater contamination, soil contamination, or maybe a vein structure that you're gonna keep drilling along strike to see how far it goes and see what the economics of that look like. Um, so there's so much that you need to know um, and need to know about each specific location. You should have a file on each location and complete rationale for why you're at that location, why you're spending your client's money there and not over here. Um, the other thing to know before you go, I, I talked about site access. You need to know where your utilities are, both above and below ground. I give you a very good uh, example of this is we contracted a big drill campaign at an industrial site where that had no active juice out there. Uh, the wires were all dead. Everything was dead. And they were going to demolish the whole property. But because they were driving over electric lines and driving under electric lines, they just decided to take them all out before they would work in that area because they really didn't like the optics and they didn't like to have kind of a casual approach towards utility or towards any kind of utilities uh, from their employees. The other thing is logistics. You're gonna have be bringing in supplies and you're gonna have to let people know how to find you and where they need to lay down those supplies. Uh, some people just call it a lay down yard. 
but it, mean, it, it needs to be uber secure. Um, if you've got a fuel tanks in there, if you've got oil storage in there, if you've got anything of value, um, we've had a whole pallet of 10W30 disappear, a whole pallet of DEF disappear. And um, the drilling, it's common that the drilling outfit will, will own whatever's in the inventory right until they use it for your project. But um, if there's recurrent problems like this, you might have to uh, hire a separate security firm. And it's uh, personally, I'm, I'm of the opinion if, um, to have an eight foot security fence with complete razor wire all the way around the top of it, um, given the dynamics we've run into in the last few years, that is not overkill. Um, the other thing you need to know is your, uh, where your water and fuel are coming from. Um, personnel considerations, I didn't really know how to put this in there, but um, the euphemism out west for personnel considerations is you're going to need to rent a blue room. And a blue room is a porta potty. And you have to have one for every four or five people in the field. If you run separate drill rigs that are far more than three to five minutes apart, then you're gonna have to have a separate blue room per rig. Um, and apart from that, you're gonna have to you prepare a very detailed scope of work. The more detailed, the closer your bids will be that they will uh, kind of re regress to the mean. Um, if it's a poorly written scope, you're gonna get bids that are all over the chart and that, that's on you, that is on you. Uh, it's not on the, on the part, uh, it's people trying to read your mind of what you did not include in the scope of work. And my recommendation to you is take each individual drill contractor out to the site to walk the ground. The best ones will ask for that on the front end, but don't take them together. And the reason I say that is while you're walking the site and learning uh, about their operation and their way of thinking and doing, you'll get a lot of good free advice from them. And I'll give you one clear cut example I ran into a couple of years ago. We had real bad problems with lost circulation and very poor recovery with a drilling contractor that we thought it was a pretty straightforward campaign. So we got three different drilling contractors uh, a couple of days apart for each to go out and walk the, uh, walk the site and one of them right from the jump said, oh, is this one of your, is this one of your sumps? And we said, yeah, that's one of the drill locations. Oh, you guys are using the wrong mud out here. And I, I, I've worked with a lot of different types of mixtures, but I didn't know that just to see it. And all of them agreed, oh, that's, that's the wrong mud. It's got too much gel for this location. And it wasn't, it wasn't three weeks later, we proved them right. I mean, that's, they got the job and they drilled it extremely well. And the other thing about um, a detailed scope of work and site walks, don't go on price alone. Uh, we've ended up hiring, uh, based on spreadsheets alone, some of the most expensive drillers I've ever worked with, but they're not expensive if they execute flawlessly. Um, and they know what they're doing and they've got a very strong safety culture. And um, they take a lot of considerations to the other things that you might oversee very quickly. And I give you countless examples of that, but the uh, the other thing you need to do is you need to do your own legwork and ground truthing. And when they give you the references, contact the references, talk it through with them, get a good feel for who they are, what they do, how they executed, you know, cost structures, etc. I have been I I, <laughs> I worked for a client who hired the first drilling contractor who was available, and ended up having this is a bad combination very young crew with very old equipment. And we had so much standby time and so much downtime and so much unproductive time, it quickly became sub-economic. So you're gonna wanna stay on top of that, but make sure they are who they say they are. Talk to, the, uh, talk to their references and just do your homework. I mean, that's your job. If they say, oh, show up and they're not who they said they were, well, you know, did you talk to the references, et cetera, et cetera. That's just do your own due diligence, and you've got to do that. So drilling methods, uh, direct push. Everybody's doing that today. It's geoprobe drilling. It's commonplace. I only have one slide about it because there's probably 60 people on this call who know more about it than me. I've also drilled with cable tool rigs. You can't poo-poo ca uh, cable tool rigs because they do have their place still. Um, they're not a rotary. It's not a rotary method. It's a very, oh, it's over a hundred year old method and it will give you a hole 
that's true, straight, and vertical. And none of these others, other than maybe Direct Bush, can say that. Uh, I have worked, worked with Rotasonic. I don't have some slides for that. Worked with them down outside of uh, Miami, Arizona. Um, but I, I don't have. Uh, Hollow Stem Auger, similarly, everybody's worked with them. And the Direct Push is slowly but surely moving Hollow Stem Augers out of the way as far as rapid implementation, small footprint, ease of operability, ease of sampling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the most popular hollow stem augers out there that I've worked with are CMEs, uh, central mining equipment. They manufacture those in St. Louis. CME 55s, the little ones, 65 and 75. I've worked with all of them. And um, uh, commonly they have crews that have been with them for a long, long time. Uh, reverse, cir reverse circulation, they just call it RC drilling. It's a different method from direct mud rotary in that, oh, and I skipped mud rotary. I'll get back to it. Um, Reverse circulation is where the circulation goes down the annulus in between the, the turning drill string and the, the wall kick, the actual borehole wall. The flow goes down through that and comes up through the center of the bit and up through the center of the drill rig or drill string. Um, in conventional mud rotary, all the fluid gets pumped down through the center of the drill string, comes out of the bit and then works its way up and develops a wall kick, a uh, mud wall kick on the way up. And so that's that's how um, the two are, they're counterintuitive, but yet you have to have completely different drill bits and really kind of a different skill set to, to uh, work with those. Where am I, Wendy? Or Kathy, you got that? There we go. Safety is a big deal. We all know that. We can't just pay it lip service. Um, I get, uh, I'm of the opinion that anybody on the project can shut it down right then and there if they see something that's not working. In the mining business, we've all known this. If we've been through Haswopper, it's 40 hours for the 29 CFR, 1910-120, and Shaw's 30 CFR. Um, we know that in the environmental business, you got to go through your 40 hours of Haswopper training and then an annual refresher. For surface operations under MSHAW, you go through a 24-hour new miner training and then an annual refresher. Um, next item here is vehicle safety. And I, I, based on personal experience, a lot of anecdotal evidence out there, the vehicle safety is the largest hazard on the project. You're not going to get hurt by the rig. You're not going to get hurt by your coworkers, slip, trip, and fall hazards, all of that those are real rarities, but people coming and going from work, getting out on the highway, that's where it happens, uh, unfailingly. Uh, in Nevada, people are deathly afraid of hitting an animal and having a rollover, whatever, from that, uh, because everybody has done it. It's just so common. But on, on site, slip, trip, and fall hazards are a big deal. We'll cover some of those. Um, but the um, just being aware of your place, where things are, and making sure that when they're on site and when the drill's turning, they have good housekeeping. And I've worked with where the, the, the muddiest, sloppiest, crummiest place to work is anywhere near the drill, drill the operating drill rig itself. There's a whole bunch of housekeeping things you can do to prevent that and having to work in a mud bog. I just, uh, that drives me nuts. And yeah, the, the, the drillers will evidence themselves very quickly whether they're comfortable working in that environment or not. Uh, I'm not. So geo supplies. This is about as far down in the weeds as I'm going to go. Um, you got everything from soup to nuts. Don't forget to take your coffee. Don't forget your vitamin drink or what have you. But that's this is this is the stuff you should know. That but there's some odd oddities in there. Um, some sieves if you're going to drill with RC. You always have to have contractor bags. Don't get the wimpy bags. And bring you. You can never be overprepared. Um, what I didn't include here is a whole toolbox because you're going to need to fix stuff from time to time. You might take a Leatherman with you so you get something that's quick and handy. But this is the type of stuff you should take to the field. And don't apologize for it. If I buy sharpies for a project, I buy a case. So same thing with contractors' bags, pens, pencils. I, I overkill on all that. The nice thing about WD-40 is if you're writing on plastic surfaces, be they the, the plastic laminated uh, core boxes or on chip trays, which are plastic, uh, WD-40 will take uh, 
a sharpie sharpie ink right off and make it fresh new surface. So that's the that's your sharpie eraser, the WD forty. Okay, fuel and water. Now there's a bunch of different places where you can get water, no matter where you are in North America. A lot of places out west, the county will establish one and you open an account with the, the county. They give you a card key, just like you're gonna be at a, a card key gas station. That's a private gas station for people who subscribe. Um, those are kind of rare. Uh, they're common in the west, but I'm not just talking to the west. So um, out in the Midwest and in, in the east, it's very common to uh, get your water through the city water utility. And a lot of that's by nippling up to a fire hydrant. And they won't just let you do that uh, and run them up with their water that they've already paid to clean and bring to drinking water standards. A lot of them will require that you put a totalizing flow meter on that, and that you use their calibrated totalizing flow meter, that you pay for the rental of that uh, totalizing flow meter, and that's the thing that's metering your water use. It's this uh, water is nothing to be trivialized with in a drill campaign. It can make or sink a program de depending on the reliability of your water supply. Sometimes you can find a, ra a rancher who has center pivot irrigation or he's got wells on his property and you're in the off season, he doesn't need the water and you can strike a deal with him, him or her. But the, uh, the key thing here is truck traffic. You want to avoid sending your uh, water truck through densely populated areas and you want to minimize the amount of left turns you take on that route. Even if it, your driver has to go well out of the way, you want to emphasize right turns to get to the facility. In addition to that, if you're going to get on any county, county uh, municipal blacktop, uh, certainly any state or federal highway, your water truck driver is going to have to have a CDL, commercial driver's license. A lot of uh, drilling firms do not have CDLs other than the primary driller. And you don't want the primary driller chasing water because whoever is driving your water truck could end up doing nothing but for the length of the program. Um, we were at a point where on a, on a very recent program, we're spending almost $18,000 a month to the county just for water. So it adds up. It's not to be trivialized. The other thing that's just a, a real and can be a real pain unless you plan well ahead of the dynamic is your fuel. Um, there's two types of diesel. There's clear and there's red. Uh, red, you don't pay the federal tax on. It's only made for off-road use. So if you've got yellow iron out there, like uh, backhoe, traco, skid steer, uh, dozer, you can run red diesel in those. You can never run red diesel in a vehicle that's going to get out on the road. But normally we try and make life simplest for everybody working who's driving a diesel truck to and from. It's free fuel for them coming and going because they don't burn anywhere near as much fuel as a drill rig will. Um, but you've got to have it locked up. You have to have your fuel locked up or you'll show up some Monday morning and the tanks are dry. Uh, those stories are very commonplace. I like fuel trailers. So whoever's your wholesaler in fuel, to the extent that you can, don't buy retail. Don't buy your fuel retail. Get it from whoever's got the small tank farm outside of Farmington or wherever you happen to be in that part of the world. Get a tank, uh, get a, a tank trailer or get a fuel bladder. Now, both are intrinsically safe because like a tank, uh, tank trailer, the way you pull up to that, it has something that looks like a regular gas pump, but it's powered off of the 12 volt battery in your vehicle. So you pull up to the pump, you pop your hood, you put the alligator clips on the two poles of your, your battery, flip the switch and you're good to go to fill your tank. But there's no, it has no... And fuel bladders are the same way. They have no power of their own, but they are grounded. And so you, you just need to know that that's a, that makes for a very easy operation. Your drillers will have diesel tanks on the backs of their saddle tanks on the back of their pickups, and they fill up there. And then they go and they offload uh, to the drill rig or whatever other piece of equipment. You don't have to take your dozer to the fuel tank. In, uh, in other words, fuel storage is a big deal because it's a high target for theft. And that's kind of intuitive. Um, I'm sure I'll come back to fuel because it always seems to be a big deal, but to the extent that you set up a fuel account 
then based on your consumption, you can set up a delivery schedule and you make sure you have ample access and egress around your tank so they can get a big uh, tanker truck may, might have a pup on the end of it and get it all the way around your tanks to fill them up so that there's no uh, constriction in uh, traffic there, access. Okay. Drilling supplies. Here, this is why I talk uh, about a laydown yard uh, and a secured laydown yard. Is um, you'll be taking deliveries on oil and kerosene. Kerosene is used to run all your heaters, and we all know there's some seasonality in North America, and you're going to want those kerosene heaters up on the rig floor or near the rig. And I'm talking about the like the salamanders or uh, the torpedoes, whatever you're using out on the uh, to keep the drillers warm. And this is especially so, we haven't even touched this subject. If you're drilling water wells or if you're drilling deep, this is not a nine to five job. You're gonna to have to figure out how you're gonna uh, change shifts every 12 hours. You have a night shift and a day shift. And then you have to cycle those folks out depending on where you are every eight days with another two shifts. But if you're just putting in you know, 30 foot monitoring wells or a lot of uh, direct push programs, uh, you don't have to operate those 24 hours, but a lot of these do. Once that bit is down there and it's turning, you cannot stop until the well is completed or the hole, you hit TD, total depth, you've, you've TD'd the hole and you're ready to trip out. And the reason I say that is, and we've run into this several times, if you leave that drill string in the hole overnight, the next morning you will experience the what I like to call the lithic grip of death, that there's no amount of heaving and pushing and pulling and trying to turn, 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 that you're going to get that drill string out of there. And the the lesson learned here, you should know this for a lot of a lot of contractors in the field, if they lose pipe in the ground, your client's paying for it, and your client's going to want to know why am I paying for that? Why didn't you have those folks trip out last night? And we get back on TD, keep drilling the next day. And I forgot is not a good answer. It's not a viable answer. So they're going to bring a lot of stuff on site. DEF, cement, bentonite, polymer, mud gel. LCM is lost circulation materials. And that's all kinds of stuff. Cotton seed hulls, walnut hulls, um, sliced up cotton. Um, they used to use cedar bark. I use cedar bark here on um, uh, the next item down. But the... Um, LCM is the stuff that plugs up your hole if you're losing circulation into the formation. Your wall cake is failing somewhere. You got to have that on site. You got to have it ready to go because you never know when you'll lose circulation. Cedar bark is when the site gets real muddy. You can spread that stuff all over and it makes it a very workable, tractable surface uh, such that nobody's going to be falling down in the mud. But you'll take delivery on pipe. Uh, most pipe programs on the scale we're talking about those are 20 foot sticks with uh, threaded on both ends. The, th these are long lead items. You've got to order this pipe no less than two months in advance of the, of the program, probably more like three. And, and the price has gone up. Uh, just last summer, I bought uh, 8,000 feet of this at uh, $32 a foot when I knew for fact a person I was working with, a competing company, had bought it the week before at $28 a foot. So if you're buying 8,000 feet at $32 a foot, those numbers are going through the roof. And, and you've just got to be very judicious about spending your client's money. Your, your, drill, your drillers will be responsible for supplying their own drill rods. Uh, those schedules can be herky-jerky, but you, you need to know they have enough on-site when you start the program to cover at least the first two or three holes. And then the last one is pallets. I'm real big on pallets. I'm real big on palletized loads. The herniated disc in my back thanks me that I've developed this new mantra about moving heavy objects um, as though I'm trying to build one of the pyramids in Egypt. I, I don't do that anymore. Samples go on pallets, core boxes go on pallets, sand goes on pallets, all the all the stuff that takes to drill holes, all of that gets palletized. Much easier to run around with a fork or a skid steer than have me do it. Um, or even the drillers helpers. If they got to move a core box, I don't like they, they, that they have to move 20 feet to put it on a pallet. Closer is better. And we'll talk about that a little bit in uh, uh, site logistics. 
So material handling, this is, you got to have some yellow iron on, on site to support the program. And commonly, one of the first things out there is a dozer. And you don't need a big, huge behemoth out there. A D6 or a D4 is more than enough for cutting in roads and laying out uh, drill pads. And uh, then you use the backhoe with a bucket to cut the sumps. Um, you need to, your driller will tell you that your driller will know intimately what the footprint of the site needs to look like. And you don't want any tight spots on the drill pad where people have to squeeze around equipment or squeeze into a shadow to get around the corner to come out. You want a nice big flat drill pad. We'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, ease of access. Also, so you can get the skid steer or the backhoe uh, or a fork all the way around. And a skid steer, I we I always, we grew up calling them bobcats, but that's a trade name. Skid steer, they're very handy because you can put a fork on them, use them as a forklift. You can put a bucket on them and use them to clean up. Uh, if the road gets corrugated or, or uh, uh, gets bad rutting, you can use them to clean it up. But the, uh, the nice thing is you can use small pieces of equipment to move around some pretty heavy loads that are palletized. The other thing is super sacks. I'm real big on super sacks, especially if you're putting samples in bags. You put the bags in a super sack and let the heavy equipment move it around. I'll show you some pictures of those. You've probably seen them in traffic a bunch of times and didn't know what you're looking at. I mean, if you're an initiate, uh, if you're new to this, uh, super sacks are big. They're very heavy duty. Uh, they'll take about a ton. Well, they'll probably take a ton. Uh, they're four by four by four, and uh, they'll they'll ha handle very heavy loads. The other thing is um, I'm big on securing loads. The most expensive product that you can generate on site is your samples. And you don't want them wiggling around in the back of a pickup truck or on a flatbed trailer as they're on the way to the lab. And uh, that's on you. And I like to secure my loads, make sure everything, like the whole stack of boxes, they're on a pallet. Then you put a pallet on top of those, nice flat load. And then you use heavy duty, heavy duty, big four inch or six inch nylon cargo straps that, that you know, they're cam actuated. Uh, so you, so you can uh, really twist down and tighten down that load. The reason I say that is if you fail to do that, then the straps over the top of your load will crush your core boxes or um, can open up, if they rub, open up your sample sacks. You don't want any of that. Uh, so be forewarned, you wanna secure your loads. Um, the straps themselves aren't expensive. I think probably the prices I've seen are 12 or $15, but you wanna have plenty. Um, if not, you get them from the driller, they just wanna get them back. But you, that's your expensive, that's your work product. You don't want anything compromising your work product on the way to the lab. We already talked to some extent about utilities, but uh, what's below ground and what's above ground? It's kind of curious, way out west, way out in the open country, it would be, it would be so odd to look for buried utilities, especially if you're way out there, but it would be very odd not to do it in, a, a, uh, in an urbanized area. In fact, you have to, check all those boxes and make sure that they're done. Now, in a lot of instances, they will only, some utility uh, uh, locators will only work in the public right away. And so if you wanna go on site, they won't sign off on that work. Uh, they'll work with the, the engineers on service to, to mark everything out. But you need to know a lot of these um, uh, public utility clearances in, the, in right away are only good for two weeks. So you might have to call them back, but you've gotta get the utilities cleared. Uh, with overhead lines, we've had to have the lines wrapped because we're going to mast up close to them. And I mean, close was like 20 feet, but anything closer than that, you don't have to touch them to have the power arc to your rig and kill everybody on the ground. So you need to be very wary and very safety conscious relative to this. Now, in a lot of manufacturing plants, chemical facilities, et cetera, they don't care um, that things are cleared, et cetera, et cetera. They're going to make you get out there with a water knife and a vac truck and pre-clear all those with a pilot uh, excavation, sometimes as deep as six or eight feet. So they know there's no utilities there and you have to have all those cleared in, uh, ahead of time. Sometimes you have to use their utility clearance uh, operators uh, that they've worked with before. Uh, sometimes you're, you'll have to sub that work yourself. The other thing is, You've got to organize your traffic once it's on once you're on site. This includes the BLM, the Forest Service, et cetera. 
you stay on the road. You just don't go wandering around, whatever. And you uh, you control that with traffic ballards, cones, yellow tape, whatever, to keep everybody on the track of where you're coming and going. They're just not free to roam around. Um, you run into a lot of trouble doing that. And so it's just to control the flow and make sure there's ample parking, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, turn around areas for the tr tractor trailer that's delivering stuff, that kind of thing. So uh, that's that's related to utilities. And the reason I say that, we've had people who did decide to go over into that empty lot and turn around and went right through a septic system and buried the back end of that truck. And uh, that area had not been cleared and they, uh, the uh, contractor, they had to foot the bill for all of that. It wasn't cheap. And the people in the trailer home were not, were not at all happy with that. So just be aware of utilities. Transportation. Uh, this is a big dog deal because I already told you that coming and going in trucks is probably the highest point of lethality in any program. I feel very strongly that no project should be more than one and a half hours away from wherever you're staying, be it a hotel, a campground, I don't care where, never more than an hour and a half. Anything longer than an hour and a half has the kiss of death written all over it because if you're going to send people into the field, it takes them an hour and a half to get there and they're going to work 10 to 12 hours out in the field and spend another um, hour and a half getting home. That's an invitation for disaster. And that's where I get into this thing about schedules. If they're, if they're too far out, you need to find facilities for them that are much more accommodating and accommodate travel fatigue. So if you have to set up a man camp or you need to move them to another town or you're working in a city and that now they need to stay in a, a uh, hotel, motel out in the suburbs, so be it. Uh, it's ruinous to go above uh, an hour and a half for travel. And that's where the implications are for schedules and for just field work. When we cost out field work, even in the environmental business, any day in the field is 12. It really is. And I think people get anything substantively done in a shorter amount of time. It's, it's just that defies a whole lot of logic and a lot of experiential anecdotal stuff I've gone through. So keep the travel time to a minimum. And if you can do that by locating your crews closer, uh, this is something that's absolutely intrinsic to the thinking of your drill crew. They won't go further than that. Um, they'll, they'll figure out a man camp or some other dynamic to accommodate that. <clears throat> okay, we wind down the program, borehole abandonment pro protocol. Um, we had, uh, this is basically, how do you turn your abandoned uh, borehole into a column of grout or uh, like a column of bentonite or a column of cement or what have you? Um, Different, different localities have different protocols. Different states have different protocols. And so you need to know before you go, what are you going to need to abandon uh, those holes that you drill? I'll give you a very good example. We're up in North, East, Western North Dakota, Eastern Montana, drilling the same holes, the same depth, same diameter. The two different states had very different abandonment protocols. And one of them led to, I think, four or five 45 foot tractor trailers full of bentonite into in in order to take care of the program. The other state did not. And so um, I won't say which is which right now I can't really remember. But if you need to have your site regraded, you'll have to do that, especially if you had pretty well developed um, drill pads uh, constructed and they were there for a long time. It's going to take a lot to regrade that site um, and, as well as infill your sumps. If you had to have sumps and you just have above ground tanks, you're going to have to backfill all of those. And any form of sump construction has to have, it can't be a, a death trap. So all sumps have to be constructed with at least a 45 degree angle to get out of it if you fall into it. Um, they can't be all uh, vertical walls on your sumps. You got to manage your trash and you have to manage your uh, investigative derived waste. Trash on lots of on large drill programs, you're going to generate a lot. So I'm more comfortable with a 30 yard roll off box that has a lid on it, the kind of ventilated lid that has the sliding uh, sliding doors on it, so you can pull up next to it, offload a pickup truck, and close the doors, and you won't have to worry about wind, and you won't have to worry about covering the load on the way to the landfill. And so that's IDW takes on its own analytical program. 
you know, you don't want to fail for T-clip. There's a bunch of other considerations that you have to make, but that's managing your IDW. Some places will require you to hydro mulch to reseed that area uh, to hopefully bring it back to whatever it was before you got on there. And if you're working on commercial properties, and I've done this before, the front lawn of a Fortune 500 company, and you're out there on the grass, you're going to have to re, uh, resod everything you mucked up out there. And they'll have, and they'll tell you when you're done, when they, when they approve the, the closure protocol and they're happy with it. Um, another thing, if you're working in the public right away, they'll have to inspect any type of uh, pavement patching that you've done and or any kind of repair. And you have to do it with their approved contractors and you, you only get released from the bond uh, when the city engineer says, everything's good to go to their specifications. You can't call it good. And your contractor can't call it good. The city has to call it good in order to, and some of the, these, these bonds aren't necessarily very expensive, but they can have high dollar values. They, they can tell you, oh, public right away, that's gotta be a $50,000 bond. You're like, whoa, uh, now you're talking some fairly serious money. So that's, that's kind of the story on wrapping things up programmatically. Uh, working in the public right away can be really, really difficult. We had one in Denver where half the Denver Nuggets lived right in that neighborhood. And it, it, it was unfortunately a fairly high profile project. In the end, it ended well. We got one more, I think. So there you have, no geologists were in, uh, injured during the production of this uh, presentation. There were some paper cuts, but I appreciate you paying attention. And Kathy, can we see some pictures now? Is that a possibility? You're muted. Oh. All right. So here's something a whole bunch of you know about already, geoprobes. Um, this technology, it's not old. It, it might be 20 years old. Uh, these are made out in Salina, Kansas, believe it or not, by a company that was put together by a bunch of farmers. And they're cranking these things out like candy. I mean, it's everybody's buying them. And I noticed the trend in geoprobes is bigger and bigger and bigger. The rigs just keep big, getting bigger so they can get to a, a deeper depth. And we'll talk about that, but it's direct push. Um, you can put adds all kinds of instrumentation to them such that you're sampling, you're sensing whatever's in the subsurface, hydrocarbons, chlorinated solvents, yada, yada, yada. But that's what these are designed for. And then you can subsample the soil uh, once you bring them up to the surface. Now, this is one of the cutest little uh, core rigs I've ever worked with. This is an acker. And this is an acker that was, I think it was produced in the uh, late 60s. It's ultimate utility, very, very small footprint. It, basically a one-man operation, maybe one and a half, one and a half person operation. Um, and it's tracked. And this, I think, is the smallest tracked drill rig that I just about ever run into. Um, very utilitarian. And this thing was absolutely fit for purpose. Uh, it outperformed several bigger rigs. It never once in about 70 holes, never once got stuck. And drilling in densely fractured rock never had problems with lost circulation. And so absolutely fit for purpose. This uh, The driller had his master's from the Colorado School of Mines and decided in, in metallurgy and decided he was going to become a driller and own his own drill rig. So that program went really well. And here it is going by. He got off of it, taking a picture. I, I had a picture of it masked up, but I had so many pictures of, um, of rigs masked up that they all kind of start to look together. But the only thing about this, the de detriment to this is it's got steel tracks. And uh, the BLM, most federal agencies, they don't make steel tracked vehicles, I believe, anymore. All your geoprobes, all your small equipment that is tracked is rubber tracked. And so just to replace, he was telling me to replace the tracks alone was $11,000. He didn't know if he was going to do it. That was a very good drill campaign. Now, this, this is off of a cable tool bit, or off a cable tool rig. And this is the bit, that big yellow iron thing with the, it's basically a huge chisel. And I've seen these things that are 10 to 12 feet uh, tall. They can wear any, weigh anywhere from 1,500 pounds to like 2,800 pounds. And all this does is go up and down, up and down. 
and beats the rock underneath and pulverizes it. Then you send a baler down, you trip that out, set it aside and run a baler down there. And it's a steel baler with a steel flap in the bottom. And you, you push that up and down, up and down, and it gradually fills with all the cuttings that are in there. And you bring it out. It's got a little spring trip to it. And you trip the leather and lever in the bottom of the baler and out come your cuttings. It's a very efficient tool and you get a straight hole. It's probably uh, on a comparable basis, it's probably the straightest hole you can, uh, you can drill. And a lot of these are, are used to drill deeper holes and to deepen holes. In fact, there's whole school, there was a school district in Phoenix who only used these type of drill rigs to deepen all their holes. Here's some of the controls on it. And this thing looks like something right out of, like something Fred Flintstone would have built, but this is very old technology and they're, they're still in use today. Uh, the most common brand, brand is a Bucyrus Erie. I've seen them with wood frames and wood decks. Uh, but here's some of the lift pins and stuff they have. Uh, right, I don't know if you can see this. This little spool, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, that's a cat head. And those were actually invented by uh, Caterpillar. But you see them on a wide variety of rigs, and they're very utilitarian in that you can throw a, a loop of rope around it. And just based on the tension that you put on the rope, you can pick up some pretty heavy duty equipment and pipe and utility things that you need. But cat heads are very common. And when the cable tool, when the and the baler is what this big vertical stick you see sticking out of here, that drops down into there. There's actually a spike in the bottom that lifts the the uh, trap at the bottom of the baler, and it just washes out to the side with a whole series of little conduits. You can direct it to wherever wherever you want that stuff to go, where maybe a bob uh, a skid steer can get to it to manage it and, and clear it out and keep the keep the site clean. This was right next to a middle school in Phoenix. So this is a mud water, a mud rotary water wheel rig, a conventional mud uh, mud rotary. Uh, the contractor here is Arizona Beeman, and these guys were out of Tucson. Not a word of English was spoken on the project. This is right outside of Coolidge, Arizona. Uh, there wasn't one day that got below 100 degrees. The worst day out there was 117, and it's just crazy, crazy hot. Big rig, a uh, big volume movement, lots of high pressure stuff. Uh, really neat program, got excellent returns, um, completed this hole, but I'll show you some of the steps along the way. Uh, this became a well, 800-foot uh, well that developed uh, 1,200 GPM, but they actually operated at about 400. These are the draw works on the side of the, they're actually in front of the, uh, the mast itself, but away from the operator. This is where, this is what, um, this is what operates the rig outside the rotary table. This is what pulls stuff up and pulls stuff down. And the best way to conceptualize just about any drill rig is it's basically a vertical crane. Um, it's made to lift and lower. It's no smarter than that. Uh, the rotary table is what gives it the roundy round and they always turn to the right. <laughs> but the thing about the, um, the nature of a drill rig being a vertical crane is the deeper and deeper you go, the heavier and heavier the drill string is above the bit. And it's the purpose of the drill rig and the draw works and the brakes on the draw works to make sure as you continue to drill, you keep the weight on the bit about the same. So the weight on the bit at 1,500 feet is the same as the weight on the bit at 3,000 feet. If it didn't compensate for the depth and the overbearing weight, you would burn bits out like crazy. And you also have to add a lot of mud, depending on downhole conditions, and a lot of circulating water in order to keep your bit cool. And not they wear down anyway, but not, not to introduce undue wear. So you always just think of these as a, a vertical crane. That's exactly what they are. And the draw works actually help to lift the uh, drill rig from transportation where it's horizontal to once they're set up on the pad to bring it up vertically. Um, these are very poor for well rehab, for anything that requires a lot of up and down motion, quick, like cycle up and down, because of the fact it wears out the brakes on the, the hoist works. But uh, hoist 
Life works just in the comment of the uh, draw works. Same the, like on a draw bridge or anything else that lifts and lowers. Very, very similar concepts. These are his controls. Uh, I notice there's a whole bunch of gauges and everything they're missing off of that. Uh, these are the tongs that are used to break the joints or make the joints um, as the sticks go up and down wherever they are in the hole. But that's basically his, his or her controls, the driller's controls. Now, here's a look at the rig floor. This, now, this, this is remarkably similar to an oil rig. And this vertical shaft right here, you won't confuse it with anything else. That's called the, the Kelly, just like it says Kelly. And uh, it seats in a big bushing right here, uh, oddly enough, called the Kelly bushing. Why would we care about that? Well, a lot of logs are not, they don't begin the log at the ground surface. They, they start it at the KB. And depending on how, how high up in the air the rig floor is, it can be as high as 60 feet. And that's in anticipation of the drilling conditions that they anticipate they'll see in the subsurface. The more you have a potential for overpressured formations at depth, the more you have the potential for a blowout or at least a kick of pressure coming up the hole quite, quite rapidly. So what they have under the rig floor, is, they call it a blowout preventer, BOP. And some of those can be literally 50, 60 feet tall. <clears throat> and we remember the Macondo that went blazing off in the uh, Gulf of Mexico, a lot of mortality associated with that. It was a uh, pressurized downhole pressure that over overpowered the uh, the BOP and the mud weight was not heavy enough to accommodate what was coming out of there. The other thing is you see some tongs here. There's a tong here and a tong here. These are used to make up or break up the joints as you as you put your drill string down. The thing with always turning to the right, the the threads are made to accommodate drilling to the right. You drill to the left or you turn to the left in order to unthread them but they're often so jammed up because of, of the downhole friction that it really takes pneumatic uh, hydraulic power to break those up. Uh, not so much on smaller rigs, but certainly on these. You can't just get by it with a, a, you know, with a pipe wrench and a four foot cheater bar on that. You need, you, you really need hydraulics. Tricone drill bit. Uh, Howard Hughes, his father invented this. First there's the bicone, then the tricone. And, uh, in a situation like this, the the uh, the fluid that's coming down holes coming right through where those three cones meet, and that's where it meets and grinds up very finely all the uh, rock that it's encountering. Very common product, uh, made a whole bunch of millionaires out there, including Howard Hughes, Hughes Tool and Hughes Tool and Die. Here we got a a, a driller uh, mixing mud to put into the sump. Uh, mud rotary uh, rigs have a dual sump. Unlike most other drilling, excuse me, uh, they'll have an initial big sump where you discharge into the big sump and all of your solids go in there, the rock that you're cutting through. Um, if and, and you collect right before it discharges to that, but uh, you'll have a backhoe on site constantly who's cleaning out all the solids in the back of or in the bottom of the big sump. Then it, then the water will flow through like a little a littler trench or a shallower trench over to a smaller sump and it's the water from that so a smaller sump that gets returned to the rig. And it sounds kind of convoluted, but it's actually fairly simple. And they cut these um, with, a, with a backhoe. And notice the orange fencing around everything on these. You, uh, you, you got to stay on top of that and they always have to be fenced in. The animals always want to get to the water and uh, you got to keep them out. And the, I can't think of anything worse than showing up at a rig and there's something in there that 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 didn't make it. It's just you got to be vigilant about that stuff. Here's everything getting ready to discharge to the sump. You see the downpipe. You can also see a couple of compress. I think I, I think so. I have some shots of these. These are pretty common trailer compressors. Sometimes if the if the compressors on the rig aren't big enough, they'll augment that with one, two, or three trailers that they nipple up together and they run in series or run in parallel, just so they have the sufficient pressure to accommodate, uh, overwhelm actually anything they see in the subsurface. Fencing that I told you about, part of the two-stage sump, and there's the trench that connects the sump. Oop. That's the trench that I was talking about. 
it's a neat system when it's all set up and running well. It's super efficient. And here it is. Notice how they run the sumps right to the limit. Uh, there's no extra room. There's no reason to accommodate any extra room because if they're going to lose water on this project or lose mud, they're going to lose it down the hole. And that's why you have to have a water truck on standby uh, ready to top off that sump as soon as anything goes amiss. And got to have the backhoe out there cleaning it up, cleaning it up, cleaning it up. And notice he's got a, a dump on the front of that such that he can muck it out, put it into a big pile, and then he can clean the pile and move it well offside, get it out of the way of anything operational. And uh, but they run. I mean, this one will run 24 hours as long as they're as long as they're drilling. Uh, I told you this is Coolidge, Arizona. It's a big cotton country down there. Um, here's an area uh, where you see they double berm the, the tanks, uh, the fuel tanks. Uh, they are double. I'm sorry, they're, they're bermed and double lined, and everything's li uh, lined. The tank, uh, the drill rig itself, has a huge uh, black tarp underneath it. Anything in a, a regular parking area, they'll do that. Compressors, they'll do the, the 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 same thing. Any kind of a pertinent equipment, all of them leak oil, and you just can't have that on the soil. It it makes for bad optics, but. Uh, it's just, you, you just can't do that to the environment. You want to have things as clean as possible such that when you mow off site, you can roll all that stuff up. You can take it to the landfill and subtitle D it, and then you're done with it. But that's the, everything gets lined. Everything gets captured. Just in case you haven't seen it, you probably passed these. The two biggest ones are Ingersoll Rand and Solaire is who makes these. And a lot of people who live in areas that, have irrigated lawns, you get to the fall and you got to blow them out so that your pipes don't freeze underground, they'll blow them out with one of these. Um, high, high volume, high capacity, it's just the perfect beast. Uh, and so if you line up several of these to help out the compressor on the drill rig, uh, they're very effective. And when it's 117 out, it's best to get duplicate samples and then go back to your air conditioned condo and log them there. Um, and some of the more well-informed geologists will take advantage of climate control and um, log, their, log their holes where it's more convenient to do so. So here's a tricone, it's resting on the Kelly bushing. And th this one, th it turned out well enough, we're gonna turn it into a well, a big one. And so the tricone has been threaded into a reamer and the reamer, has five bits on it. I think it was four or five. So you're actually trying to turn a, a tricone into an octocone, but notice it's a much larger diameter because the Hey, hello everyone. Um, we have had an internet outage uh, here I'm on my phone's hotspot, uh, so uh, I think. Um, in any case, uh, sorry about that. We will in the uh, in the webinar now. We just had another internet crash. I don't know what it is, uh, but it's something that's systemic, uh, probably either in our building. So, I, I appreciate that, everyone. Uh, again, I'm sorry that we'll have to end this webinar uh, the way we did. Perhaps we can get Matt to come back later and do just a Q and A um, on on drilling campaigns and just have that be an open Q&A. Uh, sorry about that, we'll end the video now and I appreciate all of your attendance. Thank you.